Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So this is a guy you might know. His name is Alec. You, you might have met him. He's been around the lab for a year and a half or something like that. Uh, yeah, so he's going to tell us about efficient and automatic machine learning. Go ahead. All right, so, um, so this talk's mostly also designed for sort of, oh, okay, people who might be having various varying degrees of familiarity with machine learning. So in, because I know you guys in places where I know you uh, know already what I'm talking about, I might go a little faster. Um, so, but I'll start by saying, you know, pretty cool be, to be working in machine learning right now because users pop up all over the place. So uh, we're all familiar with users in uh, web search and ranking, spam detection, uh, design of large scale recommender systems. Uh, one thing maybe uh, fewer of us are familiar about are applications and things like medical imaging. So uh, uh, when uh, kids are put in uh, MRI machines, they tend to fidget a lot. Uh, that's problematic. So one thing people have been doing is they, they've been using something called compressed sensing to, uh, uh, to reduce the amount of time uh, you need to spend in the MRI machine, so the amount of time you need to be still for. And uh, it's, uh, it's been a significant break. So this, has been, this is actually being used in MRI machines at this point. Um, variety of other uses uh, arise in computational biology, for instance, in uh, large-scale genome-wide association studies. Uh, optical character recognition to uh, scan checks, uh, uh, talking to our phones using automatic speech recognition and often translation and so on. Uh, but the thing that uh, excites me actually the most is that, so all these uh, diverse applications of course have their own sets of complexities and challenges, uh, but they also share a lot of uh, common uh, features when you think about designing a solution for almost any one of them. Um, and People use different names for uh, these aspects, but I think uh, most of us agree on what the specific elements are. So the first step almost always is you start from some fairly raw source of data, and you're trying to convert it into a form that's intelligible to a machine learning algorithm. So uh, this is, uh, you, you might start with, uh, with, with text or audio video signals or images or whatever you have, um, and you often hand code these things called features to uh, in a process called feature engineering, but lately there's been a lot more emphasis on trying to learn this part of the pipeline. Uh, once you have representation, the second step is what I would call modeling, which is essentially a lot of our statistical reasoning about the problem. So what kind of input-output mapping do we uh, want to learn? What is the goodness of uh, fit measure that we are going to use? Is this a classification problem, regression problem, clustering problem, so on? Maybe we want to enforce some structure on uh, the parameters we're trying to learn through some regularization techniques and so on. And even after we've done the representation and modeling, you of course have to go ahead and uh, compute the final solution, which requires computation. And in my talk, uh, most of my and most of my work, this uh, computation involves doing, uh, solving some kind of optimization problem, uh, and often the scale uh, of the problem will necessitate the use of distributed algorithms. In fact. Um, so my research uh, touches on all these different aspects of designing solutions to machine learning problems, not just in isolation, but often also reasoning about their uh, interactions and various trade-offs amongst the quality of these uh, aspects. Uh, of course, uh, I cannot really talk about all of them in one talk, so uh, I'll pick a couple of favorites today. And uh, the first part, uh, actually, some of you might be familiar with this is stuff I did when I was interning at Yahoo Research uh, on distributed machine learning. And the second part will be more recent work that I uh, did with some summer interns in a New England lab and visitors um, uh, last, last summer uh, on, uh, on this question of learning good feature representations using a particular technique that I'll talk about. All right, so let's uh, start with the first question of uh, distributed machine learning. So, so this is work um, I did when I was visiting uh, most of you guys at Yahoo. And um, the one sort of, uh, for, for me, the motivation was I, uh, I had already been looking at 
uh, theory of distributed uh, machine learning during my PhD and then I had the chance to actually develop some of these systems at large scale when I uh, visited John and uh, there were some interesting problems and data sets that we could apply the techniques to like uh, the computational advertising task where we were trying to predict click or no click uh, given a, a, a user ad web page uh, example. And this was a pretty sizable data set. We had about 17 billion uh, such collection of web page ad pairs. And um, we, we were trying to solve this using a logistic regression problem where there were a lot of parameters that we needed to fit in order to get good predictions. We had about 16 million parameters. And, uh, and so at this scale, we just could not uh, consider solving this problem all on one machine. Distributed algorithms were necessary. Right, so the setup here, and in fact, in a, a large variety of uh, distributed machine learning is that you have access to some kind of a computational cluster. You can think of it as a distributed network of communicating nodes where each node is a computer in the cluster and each link represents a network connection. Your data is stored in some kind of a distributed file system. So, so the individual nodes might own subsets of your data, like subsets of the click logs in the previous example. Uh, but what you're interested in is fitting some kind of a function over this entire distributed data set. So uh, again, in the previous example, uh, the, the examples consisted of some representation of user ad web page as a feature vector. We were trying to predict click or no click using some vector of logistic regression parameters. And crucially, uh, this, uh, this fitting needed to be done over the data summed over uh, all the examples. So no one node can solve this problem in isolation because it does not have the entire data. Right? Um, now, uh, this is not a new problem. There are many people who have looked at uh, distributed machine learning. And when you uh, try to approach the problem, there are many things that often go wrong and have gone wrong. So it's very easy to design an approach by exclusively focusing on its communication or computational complexity. When you do that and try to use it, then you choke on the aspect you did not care about, and it does not work. Um, it's pretty tempting often to take a particular machine learning algorithm and try to parallelize it. Uh, machine learning, of course, is a moving field, so the algorithm would often become obsolete, and your effort goes to waste. So we want to, in fact, do something that can take large classes of algorithms and parallelize them so that uh, this can be valid uh, at least for some reasonable amount of time. And even when you get these things right, what can happen is that you you have an algorithm, it works within a particular infrastructure. You have a large data set that's stored in some other infrastructure, like a MapReduce cluster, for instance. These do not play well. You cannot run on the large data set. So, so you need to have a match between the machine learning uh, system and, uh, uh, and the system in which the data is being stored. And finally, uh, you don't want to end up in a situation where your distributed machine learning algorithm looks completely different from any single machine algorithm you've ever written, because that would mean that you have to re-implement everything from scratch, and that's just a pain if you're trying to do it yourself. Right, so what I'll describe to you now is one way uh, we found to circumvent these challenges. Of course, there might be others possible. So uh, the core problem that uh, we wanted to solve was to uh, fit a parameter over large data set by minimizing some kind of a loss function. And there are two main classes of solutions exist to solve this type of problems. There are so-called um, stochastic optimization methods. An example is stochastic gradient descent. We do not need to know what, that, what exactly that is for this talk. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you all we need to know. And uh, another class is uh, batch optimization. An example of this is uh, just gradient descent or its more advanced variants. So let's start by looking at what a distributed stochastic gradient algorithm looks like roughly. So the idea here is that you have a bunch of nodes, each with its local data set. Each node starts going over the local data set, running this stochastic gradient descent algorithm, whatever it is, and comes up with a local solution like W1 on node 1, which is a good solution for this guy's local data set. Similarly, node 2 comes up with W2, which is a good solution for its data set, and so on. So you take these local solutions, you just average them. Now sometimes what happens is that this average is already a good enough solution for this entire distributed data set because it has, of course, uh, some elements from part of each local data set. Sometimes it's not. 
if, if it's not, then you take this, you feed it back up, and start another round of stochastic gradient descent on each machine uh, from this initial point, and you repeat this process a few times. Okay, so that's one approach people have looked at extensively. The second approach is uh, what I call the distributed batch optimization approach. And the intuition there is that, so we're trying to minimize this function which has, which has the form uh, indicated here. And one approach to minimize any function is that you start somewhere and um, do an iterative uh, algorithm where given your current solution wt, you find the direction in which the function is decreasing at that point wt. This is going to be the negative gradient direction at that point. And you take a step in that direction, and if you do this often enough, you will eventually uh, reach the bottom of the function. Right? Now in particular, when f looks like the sum of losses over data points, then the gradient also looks like the sum of gradients over data points. And when your data is distributed over a cluster, then this sum further breaks up into two terms. There is the inner sum over the examples on a particular node j. So this is completely local to node j. It can com compute it once it knows the current solution wt, node j can compute this uh, totally locally. And then you have an inner sum across the different nodes for which you need some communication. You need to accumulate these local gradients across nodes somehow in order to get the outer sum. And so the, uh, pictorially what it looks like is each machine now does a local gradient computation in, on its local data set, obtains these local gradient vectors, and then takes a step in the negative gradient direction where the gradient is accumulated over everybody, finds the new solution, and re resumes local gradient computation iteratively. Okay, these both stochastic and batch methods, by the way, are very well studied in theory, and uh, a lot is known about uh, how, when you run them, how the optimization error goes down as you go over the data uh, many, many times. So uh, in blue here, I've shown stochastic, which drops the error really fast initially. The red one is not even on the chart uh, initially. But after a while, once red get, starts getting to a good point, then it's dropping the error much faster and eventually overtakes the blue. So when I first uh, saw this picture, I felt like there was opportunity for a beautiful synergy here by taking sort of the best of uh, both the worlds. What we want it to be on is on this black line, really, doing stochastic initially and batch later on. That would be the ideal thing to do. And that's roughly what we did. So the idea was we initially start by doing this distributed stochastic gradient descent, uh, right? So we compute stochastic gradient, uh, we, we compute these local solutions on each node, we average them, and now we disseminate this average solution uh, back to each node, and now we go into a batch optimization phase. So, so now we start computing local gradient at each node. Once we are done doing that, we take a step in the negative gradient direction, like before. And now, we repeat just the second part of the pipeline. So, so we take this updated solution and start doing local gradient computations from it again. Right? So we're just repeating the batch phase now for many iterations after doing the stochastic ones. You, you can do the stochastic two times as well if you like. It doesn't sometimes make a dif makes a difference, sometimes doesn't. But uh, this we definitely repeat many times now. So it turns out this idea can be quite powerful. You can show in theory that the hybrid approach, uh, this uh, switching from stochastic to batch after a while, can reduce the computation by up to a factor of two. Um, right? And this factor of two can matter because this might often mean running something for an hour versus running it for 30 minutes. Uh, it's not just a figment of theory. So you can, when you run these algorithms in practice, what you observe is, uh, something like shown here. So the dotted curve is what you get if you run, uh, if you take best of individual stochastic and batch on the computational advertising task. And the solid one is what you get with uh, hybrid. So it's consistently better. This is uh, optimization error versus number of passes over data. So think of it as computation. 
computation structure is exactly the same. I think. Okay, now so far I've told you kind of cartoon distributed algorithms in the sense, you know, I said, okay, we're gonna average some local weights for stochastic, we're gonna add some local gradients in batch. And nobody really called me out by asking, well, how do you actually do it? Uh, because you have to, you know, they, these, these things are spread over a network and you have to actually add them up. So how do you, uh, you have to understand how to do this. So, so there's some good news here because there is an abstraction called all reduce, which is extremely old in parallel computing, which has exactly the right input output characteristics for us. So uh, this abstraction assumes an initial state where each node has a local number or a vector of numbers and produces a final state where each node has the sum of all the numbers or sum of all the vectors. So if you applied all reduce to local weights or local gradients, you would be able to compute the sums you wanted. And roughly uh, the, the same way of say implementing such a thing would be uh, you, uh, you just impose uh, a tree structure over your nodes which hold these numbers and you start summing numbers up the tree. So for instance here I have, uh, you have five and four which are passed up the tree at, combined with this two to get 11 on this node. Similarly here you end up with 16, you propagate them further and now root has the sum of everything. Once the root has the sum of everything, you can propagate it back down, just broadcast. And now everybody knows the entire sum. Right? So distributed machine learning with all reduce can look very simple. Now we can go into our hybrid method, just put a call to all reduce here for weight summation, here for gradient summation, and this now is a legitimately distributed algorithm. Right? So, so just by inserting all reduced calls in two places. And all reduce in fact does exist as a, a, a genuine software implementation. It's not just a theoretical abstraction, it's provided in MPI, message passing interface, which is one of the oldest parallel computational frameworks. Now this is where we ran into a bit of a snag because large data sets are typically not stored in MPI clusters. They were they are most often stored in MapReduce clusters, and this was definitely the case at Yahoo, where everything was available in Hadoop clusters, right? Um, and there are some good reasons, apart from all the data processing uh, functionalities Hadoop provides, it also gives very nice fault tolerance. It has something called speculative execution to deal with uh, slow machines. Uh, it provides data lo local computation to minimize communication. And so there are good reasons to be using MapReduce. Our solution to uh, try and uh, get the best of both was to just develop a Hadoop compatible version of all reduce, right? So we, we wrote our own all reduce that works on Hadoop. Um, this requires uh, doing some careful engineering to make it work right. But once you do, you end up with a robust system, robustness coming from Hadoop, but which has very fast communication where the fast communication comes from all reduce. And it is really fast. So here is an example of what happens when you do just one iteration of gradient descent, distributed gradient descent, um, on two different sizes of data using map reduce in blue, uh, on, in red and all reduce in blue. Right, and this is the difference in times in one iteration. Now imagine if you had to do 10 or 15 iterations, which is not atypical at all, then you don't want to be facing the red time. You, you would much rather uh, pay the blue time. Overall, we can reason about the characteristics of the resulting system now, and uh, it's pretty easy to make sure uh, the system has balanced communication and computational complexities. This can be done pretty easily just by controlling sort of the, the size of local data on each node and the number of nodes. Um, the system is naturally iteration friendly. This was the biggest problem with vanilla map reduce. It's not iteration friendly, whereas with all reduce, um, you have a persistent communication topology on which you can communicate as many times as you like. By design, it's Hadoop compatible, of course, so we can work with large data sets stored in the MapReduce clusters. And the, uh, the, the, the thing that's practically very attractive is that really, so when I showed you the, my diagram, there were two calls to all reduce, but even in the code often, you can just uh, take a serial machine learning algorithm, insert a couple of calls to all reduce, and you end up with a distributed algorithm, which is extremely powerful. Want to show you some experimental evaluation we did of our system. Uh, so I already uh, mentioned the display advertising task from Yahoo that uh, 
that we worked on, and we also tested on another uh, open source, uh, uh, open data set available in uh, academia, which is comes from computational biology, something called uh, predicting human acceptor splice sites. Uh, reason we picked it is it's quite large, about 50 million examples, 11 million dimensions per example. So the first thing you want to check for any parallel computational system is its speed up as you add more and more nodes. And here I show the speed up as we go from 10 to 100 nodes, and the dotted line is the ideal linear speed up, which is the best you can hope to get. While we are not quite there, we are not too far off either. It's a pretty substantial speed up going from 10 to 100. And the important thing is it does not just die off at 100. In fact, we scaled the system to 1,000 nodes on the Yahoo clusters where it was pretty easily scaling up to that level. We uh, also compared our method with a couple of uh, other approaches, uh, one that was developed by a different group in Yahoo Research itself and one that was developed at Microsoft Research. Uh, here I'm showing the prediction accuracy, so higher is better. Uh, as we, again, go make more and more passes over the data, what we see is our method is definitely consistently higher. And what we do not show here is that uh, these number of passes over data can, in fact, have different uh, wall clock times for different methods. So some of these are, in fact, uh, have very excessive communication complexities. So their wall clock time might be much higher, which we are not penalizing them for. And a lot of other methods that I have not shown here are not being shown because they would not fall on this chart. Um, the system uh, is available uh, open source uh, in Vopal Wabit and um, Definitely, uh, I, I can speak from my, my experience that it is being uh, adopted uh, within some teams at Microsoft at this point. Yahoo, of course, uh, filed and filed, I guess, a patent for it when we first did it and uh, potentially being used in some other places as well where VW is being used. Um, so, so that's sort of the, the first part of the talk where uh, the, the thing that sort of, um, so I'm somebody who also does a lot of theory, so the thing that, this, that appealed to me most about this work was we started with some very concrete theoretical insights into these optimization algorithms. And by combining them with the right uh, engineering tricks, you were able to uh, obtain an overall system uh, that is uh, practically quite effective. Now, sometimes you face the converse problem. You have something that works very well in practice. You have absolutely no idea why. And that's going to be, in fact, the problem we face in the second part of the talk. when I talk about my work on dictionary learning. And like I said, this work was, uh, came out of some things I was doing earlier and then a summer internship last summer uh, in Microsoft New England. Let me start by describing my mo main motivation for this problem. So the idea is when we do machine learning in practice, data takes various shapes and sizes. Sometimes it's uh, uh, text documents, sometimes it's images, sometimes it's audio video signals. But when we write our papers and design our algorithms, it's really tempting to think of data as organized in this uh, neat matrix where each uh, row is an example, and each example is encoded as a vector of real numbers. And you see this, you've got to ask, well, what do these numbers mean? So typically, these numbers are hand-coded by a process called feature engineering, which can take considerable amount of time and skill, quite, can be quite painful but it's absolutely essential to good performance of any machine learning system in practice. And so it's a pretty reasonable question to ask whether we can learn these good features from data directly rather than actually hand coding them. A different motivation for the same problem comes from the field of uh, signal processing uh, when, we, uh, when you think about signal compression. So it's uh, not a, a difficult thing to recognize at all that high resolution images or high resolution videos can take a lot of space to store, right? In general, any high dimensional signal can be expensive to store. Of course, if a high dimensional signal is sparse, if it has only a few non-zero entries, then you just store the non-zero values and their locations, and that's pretty cheap. But sparsity, again, is a question of representation, right? So if you take an image, it might not look sparse in its pixel representation, but maybe there's a different representation where it looks sparse. So you can ask, well, can we just learn a representation where signals of interest are sparse so that we can compress them effectively? Now, in practice, the answer turns out to be yes. 
so here I'm showing an example. This is not my work, somebody else's work uh, from 2009. So what they did was they took a database of facial images and they wanted to compress. So one option would be to use uh, a standard algorithms like JPEG or discrete cosine transform or something. But they said, let's just find a representation where facial images look sparse and then use that to compress. And you do that, you obtain this compression, which is definitely the best of the lot here, most accurate of the original. And this, this is not just a one-off result. Uh, similar successes have been repeated over and over. In fact, go back much further in image denoising, in painting super resolution, and many, many other applications. Now, the trouble is that most of these practically successful methods rely on some kind of uh, solution of a non-convex optimization problem, uh, which is very problematic in theory because we do not have good understanding of what's going on. Uh, how, how are we able to solve these non-convex optimization problems? And so there's, a, there's sort of a substantial gap between the state of theory and practice uh, in this area, and I'm going to provide one answer that attempts to bridge this gap. So let's, let's now try to set up the problem we're interested in a bit more formally. And the idea is that we have some example, like a facial image shown here. And we want to decompose this example into a sum of some basis elements, like eyes, nose, mouth. Maybe you want to add a couple of ears here. You, know, you get the basic idea. You might have another face, and then you will have a different pair of eyes, nose, and mouth, of course. And in general, you might have a whole database of facial images. You'll have a collection of these dictionary elements. And now, you try to encode each face using this dictionary through this coefficient matrix, right? So the number of columns in the coefficient matrix is equal to the number of faces here. For each face, this uh, black indicates a non-zero entry saying, oh, this, uh, this face is going to contain this uh, this eye and this eye and this nose and this mouth, right? So we are encoding faces using this dictionary rather than the raw pixel values. Now, this is just a cartoon example. This is not how you're going to uh, do this if you wanted to do it in practice. You would probably do this over image patches or something. But this can be quite powerful because the sparsity of this coefficient matrix, uh, note that suggestively there are a lot of zeros in this coefficient matrix. And that's because we want to do effective uh, compression or signal pro other signal processing tasks using this representation. So just a couple of more observations about the setup. So in general, I'll think of my examples as arranged in a matrix where each example gets a column. And a column uh, has uh, d, d, d entries. So think of them as like a column is a face, uh, which is encoded using its pixel values. We want to uh, decompose it using a dictionary A star, and there are going to be R dictionary elements. These are the R things we want to find. And we have a coefficient matrix uh, that, that gives us the encoding in terms of the dictionary, and we want the coefficient matrix to be sparse. Now, there are a few other ways you can think about this. So some of us are familiar with uh, what a topic model is. So you can think of uh, Ys as documents. A star as topics like business and news and politics and uh, whatnot. And now the model posits that no document has too many topics in it. That's why you have sparsity in the coefficients. Or uh, you, you can think of this as an over, overlapping clustering model where you want no data points should belong in too many clusters. And A star gives the cluster centers. Uh, one piece uh, that I want to point out is that we, we work in what is called the overcomplete setting here meaning this dictionary can be pretty wide, right? So you want to actually allow the discovery of potentially a lot of uh, dictionary elements. And that's because this is often the most relevant uh, setting in the, in the applications of this setup. OK, so I have told you what the problem is. Now let me start describing what the practically uh, used solution to this problem looks like. So usually what people do is uh, they start with, of course, we want to uh, factorize the data as dictionary times coefficients, where the coefficient matrix, we want it to be sparse. And one way of enforcing sparsity is minimizing the L1 norm, the sum of absolute values of the coefficient matrix. Don't worry about if you don't know why this is a good surrogate for sparsity. That's not really crucial to understanding anything in the talk. Right? And 
now they say, OK, let's start with some initial guess of what the dictionary might look like. You might even pick this randomly. You might pick this according to some heuristic, whatever you want. We fix that. And now we try to find the best set of coefficients given the dictionary, which, uh, which just turns into what we would call a sparse regression problem. This is a very standard kind of problem uh, in machine learning and statistics. And there are many good solvers available for this once we have fixed the dictionary. So now we obtain a certain set of coefficients. And we, we fix them and say, well, what is the best dictionary for these coefficients? And this is just a system of linear equations. You can solve it using least squares. And now you iterate between these two steps, updating the coefficients given dictionary and dictionary given coefficients. Okay, so this might look very similar to EM algorithm for this problem, or k-means, uh, where sparse regression is like assigning each data point to its nearest cluster. And uh, least squares is like uh, uh, setting cluster center based on the average of uh, the, the points. And just like EM or k-means, this algorithm does not converge to the global optimum using an arbitrary initialization A0. So let's see a little more why that is the case. Uh, the key thing to note is that we're, the, all these methods are trying to solve this optimization problem where they want to enforce the constraint y equals to ax with a and x both being optimization variables. Now this turns out to be a non-convex constraint. And the easiest way to see this is that average of solutions is not a solution. So let's take a factorization a times x for the matrix y. Then of course, minus a times minus x is also a factorization. But now let's take the average of the two, right? So a plus minus a over 2 and x plus minus x over 2. You get 0. You don't get y. This does not happen in a convex problem. The average of two feasible solutions is a feasible solution. So this is a non-convex optimization problem. These problems are NP-hard in general. So if we want to solve this, and we, we are solving this in practice, then there must be some, some special structure present in the problem, something else going on that's enabling uh, good solutions. So this non-convexity has precluded theory from existing for this problem. By and large, there is only one notable exception, uh, work of uh, Daniel Spielman and co-authors from Yale uh, in 2012, who showed uh, that, OK, if we uh, leave this alternating minimization business, we can come up with a different linear programming algorithm to solve the problem. We don't want to use, uh, lose the alternating minimization flavor, because that's what people are using in practice. So, so we instead took, the, took this method and combined it with a novel initialization strategy. And what happens now is that you can show under certain conditions, you can get to the global optimum of this non-convex problem by uh, leveraging this initialization in the overcomplete setting of interest. So that's going to be the main result uh, that I'll present to you now. So let me give some intuition about the initialization procedure. The idea is we, we take our example matrix Y, and we try to find a subset of the examples, all of which have a non-zero coefficient on a particular dictionary element, like the red one shown here. So the idea is if you could find these examples, and actually if you plot them on a graph, then they look something like uh, the plot shown here. In which case, if they, have, they all have a strong component in the red direction. Now, if your data looks like this, and if you run PCA and take the top PCA vector, you get something pretty close to the red direction. So given this green matrix, finding the red vector is easy. So then the job reduces to finding this green submatrix from our big matrix of examples. This is where uh, one key piece of our intuition comes in, where the, we use the idea of looking at correlations between our data points. So uh, the intuition is that if two data points have non-zero coefficient, and a reasonably large non-zero coefficient on a common dictionary element, then if you, if you take their correlation, that should be relatively large because they both have a component in a common direction. So we, so we build a graph where we can put an edge between where each node is a data point, And we put an edge between two data points if they have a large magnitude of correlation between them. Right? So you, you obtain a full graph this way. Now, 
what we do is we look for large cliques or approximate cliques in this graph. The intuition here is that one edge means this node and this node have a dictionary element in common. But now if you look at the blue, blue, blue clique, you can further say that every pair of nodes in this blue clique have a dictionary element in common. And with some work, you can in fact show that with high probability, they all have the same dictionary element in common. So dictionary element one is going to be contained in each of these examples. Similarly, if you look at the red clique, then they are all going to contain, for instance, dictionary element two and so on. This is not obvious, this takes some work, but let's assume that is true. Then our work reduces to just finding these approximate cliques in the graph. So here's a simple way of looking for these cliques. I start from an edge, I find all the common neighbors of both the endpoints of the edge. Right, that gives me the blue clique. I could get unlucky if I start from the magenta edge, then I don't just find the blue clique, I find the union of the blue and red cliques, and this would be problematic because this is not a clique, this is a union of two cliques, some of which contain dictionary element one, some of which contain dictionary element two. But these two neighborhoods look visually very different, right? So you can just, uh, there's a simple procedure, you can just take an edge, find its common neighbors of both the endpoints, count the number of edges in that neighborhood, and you can actually distinguish pretty easily whether you're in the green case or the magenta case. I'm not gonna give you the exact details of the procedure, but roughly what the initialization algorithm now ends up looking like is you construct a correlation graph with a certain threshold. For each edge, you first test whether the edge is good. If it's good, you find all the common neighborhoods, uh, co common neighbors of the endpoints, build their covariance matrix, take the top PCA vector, and that's an estimate of a dictionary element. That's your initialization for one dictionary element. And you repeat this for many edges, and you build an, the whole uh, initial dic dictionary estimate. I want to mention that a uh, similar algorithm was also developed uh, independently and simultaneously by uh, Sanjeev Arora and uh, uh, students uh, at, at Princeton. Okay, now I would like to state some results about the algorithm I just described and for doing that, uh, remember I said this problem is going to be NP hard in general, so we need some assumptions and I'm gonna make a couple on this slide. So we assume that the dictionary satisfies what is called incoherence. This is a pretty standard assumption in the literature and says that if you take two dictionary elements, they should be uh, roughly, ortho uh, they should be close to orthogonal. They shouldn't have very high alignment with each other. We assume that the coefficients uh, themselves are sparse and in fact, the sparsity pattern is random, is not pathological uh, in any way. Um, so under these assumptions, suppose you're given order R squared examples, where remember R is the number of dictionary elements we are trying to discover. Now we take the, use the graph clustering algorithm first and take its solution, use that to initialize our alternating minimization procedure. Then with high probability, nice things happen. So, if you measure the distance of uh, the iterates that alternating minimization is generating uh, to the true dictionary A star, then you have the error at each step of alternating minimization. So with sufficiently many steps, you can recover the true dictionary to arbitrarily high precision, me meaning you're getting the exact recovery of this dictionary with order R squared samples. And so we, we, we managed to solve this non-convex problem uh, to the global optimum through, through our use of initialization procedure. And the key intuition, again, I wanna highlight is that the first initialization step gives us an approximate recovery of the dictionary, and then we can improve this uh, approximate estimate through steps of uh, alternating minimization. So I kind of gave some intuition about the initialization already. I wanna just uh, show you a little more intuition about how we establish the local linear convergence of alternating minimization. So the intuition is ideally, we want that we start from some initialization here, A0, there is some global solution that we want to converge to, and we take our alternating minimization steps, finding coefficients, and finding the next dictionary, and so on, and we want each step taking us closer to the global optimal solution. Of course, that's a good case. It might happen that one of these steps, remember A1 is just an estimate for A star. So maybe when you 
estimate the coefficients using A1, you actually get completely bad coefficients and in fact doing worse than where you were before. You need to rule out such back steps from happening. And that's kind of the main uh, crux, uh, the, the, the main crux of the argument is how to rule out uh, not making progress in some steps of alternating minimization. So this is where sort of one of the key results that we established comes in, which, which says, suppose you have a set of coefficients that are not too far, about one over s close to the real, uh, real coefficients, to the true coefficients, then if you use them to estimate a dictionary, then the error in the dictionary will be this factor s squared over square root d times the error in the coefficients. So in particular, if s squared is suitably small compared to root d, then the error in dictionary will be smaller than the error in coefficients. In fact, you can further relate the error in coefficients to the error in previous dictionary, and that kind of gives you a contraction because it connects the error in dictionary at time t plus one to the error in dictionary at time t. And one thing I wanna highlight here is this suppose condition. So this, this thing only kicks in once you're already sufficiently close to the true solution, and the only way we can do this is by using our initialization method. The initialization method basically gives us a dictionary that ensures the precondition of this lemma. And then from there, we can use this argument to reliably uh, decrease the error. Okay, so um, I wanna start wrapping up. Um, so in the first part of, our, uh, of the talk, we saw an efficient distributed machine learning system. And the second part of the talk was about trying to ma make machine learning more automatic by learn learning feature representations that can handle diverse forms of data. And one thing I sort of like about both these, uh, both these uh, works is that they both involve um, sort of uh, some uh, nice theoretical ideas that result in practical algorithms. And this is something I sort of like to do more broadly in my research, which leads also into many other directions, just a couple of which I wanna point out. Um, so, so one thing I spent a lot of time thinking about and I still think about is, um, often people think about computational and statistical aspects of a machine learning problem in isolation. But in practice, there are very, very interesting trade-offs between them. So um, we want to answer questions such as, if, if, you, if you want to estimate some quantity, and you have access to only limited amounts of data and computation, then how well can you solve the problem? Or if you want to design a computationally budgeted statistical inference procedure, how do you go about doing that? Right, so a particularly nice example that arises uh, as, a, as an instantiation of this general question is, um, so a lot of us uh, of, uh, that, are, that are working often with high dimensional uh, objects look for specific structures like sparsity or low rank in matrices and so on. And uh, there are very nice statistical procedures known uh, to, to exploit these structural assumptions. But the underlying computation for, for, doing that, for doing that inference also suffers from the high dimensionality of these objects. And it's pretty natural to ask, can you also design computational procedures that leverage these sparsity or low rank assumptions just like we do in statistics. And so I've worked on algorithms that can actually do this. And uh, doing so actually involves uh, a combination of te techniques both from statistics and optimization and results in nice algorithms. So uh, another uh, set of questions which I have worked on and plan to continue working on uh, going forward. Uh, so. So one situation that arises repeatedly and definitely uh, here at Microsoft is uh, we have an exploration versus exploitation type scenario. So, so we have some system that uses machine learning uh, to present, uh, present an outcome such as a set of search results. It receives some feedback from the user and we want to use this feedback to further improve the system. And in doing so, we, have, we cannot just apply standard machine learning techniques as is. There are causal feedback loops that arise that have to be properly dealt with. Uh, so, so this is something I've been working on. We have some nice results here, and but 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 there there is sort of a broadly open field here, both in terms of statistical and computational questions. 
Um, and uh, the second part, I mean, we already saw one example today of uh, this. So there are many of these non-convex optimization problems that arise in machine learning. They're being solved by people very effectively in practice, but theoretically there is uh, limited to no understanding of what's going on. And uh, I, I think the theoretical understanding is in particular important because you would like to, in many cases, design better algorithms than the ones that currently exist to solve these problems faster, larger scale data, and so on. And so this, I think, is a very exciting and sort of a newly emerging area of research in machine learning uh, that uh, I'm very excited about and uh, definitely plan to work on in the coming years. So that's all I had to say. Thanks a lot for your attention. So I think we had a whole zero questions uh, because presumably any of us already have asked these questions. <laughs> but are there any additional questions that anybody might have? I mean, I feel like the people who are seeing this talk for the first time might have questions. Yeah, yeah. Apart from there's a few who might have seen it for the first time. Great. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you, Alex.